Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, The Power of Professionalism, Cultivating Civility in Legal Practice, Kari Sheehan discusses some initiatives regarding general civility and their role in the legal environment. If you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. We can see this too coming through in the States. How many of you remember way back when when you did that character and fitness exam, some of us way back when, some of us more recently. And that character and fitness exam was when you sat for the bar. If you remember, maybe you had to talk to a local practitioner. You had to fill out an application of the, like, your criminal history, everything you've done up until that point of wanting to be a lawyer. And they were examining your character and fitness. They're trying to figure out, are you going to be a civilized professional lawyer? Are you going to conduct yourself in a manner appropriate for lawyers? And are you going to be successful at that? Because we are a self-governing profession. Rule 8.3 tells us that. And that means under Rule 8.3 that if we see other lawyers not acting civilly, not acting professionally, or violating the rules of professional conduct, and we know they're doing those things, then we have a duty ourselves to report them to the Bar Association and to the Disciplinary Commission. This is Rule 8.3. Now, this is a very hard rule because how many of you want to tell on your colleagues? How many of you want to tell on your peers for not doing the appropriate things or not acting ethically? This is a hard rule. Now, the Rule 8.3 is very concise. It tells us that we only have to report or disclose another lawyer's conduct if we absolutely 100% know that they violated the rule. So it's that knowing standard. If we're just like we think they did or we assume they did, we don't reach that standard. It's if we know. Now, obviously, if you think they did and you still want to report, you are still welcome to, but you are not held to report or mandated to report until you actually know another lawyer violated the rules. If you fail to report and would meet that knowing standard, you yourself could be in trouble. So we do have that self-regulation where they force us to report if we know. Otherwise, it's our discretion on what we do. Now, they also get us to, not just through that fitness and character exam and the self-governing and profession, they also want to really reinforce this to all lawyers, too, and it starts with that oath of attorneys. How many of you remember raising your right hand and taking an oath? Probably all of us remember doing that, but probably not all of us remember what we said when we did that. And that is the key, too, because a lot of jurisdictions, they have embedded into their oath certain phrases that you will maintain professionalism and act in a professional manner. For instance, in South Carolina, when you raise your right hand and take that pledge or oath to be a lawyer, the oath includes the phrase, to opposing parties and their counsel, I pledge fairness, integrity, and civility, not only in court, but also in all written and oral communications. In Indiana, we raise our right hand and say, I will abstain from offensive personality. And this is interesting because we take these oaths, we say these words, we don't remember it. And you can go back to your own oath, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. And then we have to remind ourselves that this applies 24 hours a day, seven days a week in our personal and professional capacity. Now think about that for just a second. And if I could see all of you and see your hands, I would take a poll. And the poll would be, how many of you could say that in your personal capacity, meaning your everyday life with your spouse, significant other, friends, family, children, neighbors, strangers, out on a walk, out at a park, at a bar, wherever you frequent, have maintained a civilized, professional demeanor? Or as in Indiana, they say, abstained from offensive personality. Some of you may be shaking your head and say, like, yeah, I could, I could pass that muster. But can I pull your spouse or significant other? Can I ask your kids or friends if you've always abstained from that offensive personality? If you've always been civil and upheld the high standards of fairness and integrity? And as I pull other people, we may get a different response. Because for some reason, lawyers don't think the rules apply in their personal lives, but they do. 
If you go out and are offensive to someone or have an offensive personality, you can violate the rules and have your license just you can be disbarred or have your license yanked or disciplined and then not even be related to the practice of law. So let me give you an example of this. This is an example. It was a few years ago now, probably about actually probably about five or so years ago when this when I was came across this story. And this was a gentleman who was driving home on a highway. So he wasn't practicing law. He was just driving on a highway. And just think of the most congested highway or system in your town. There's traffic, there's people cutting you off, there's all kinds of things going on, and that road rage starts to develop. So this attorney was driving. This car kept weaving in and out, kept cutting them off, cutting them off, cutting them off. The attorney got so mad, he get, he gassed it up, he, you know, sped up really fast, swerved in front of this car who kept jutting in and out of traffic, slammed on his brakes to make the car stop, the one that had been causing him such aggravation. He got out of his car, grabbed his golf club from the back seat of his car, just came from golf maybe, slammed it into the other driver's windshield, and then threw it back in the car, got back in the car, and drove off. Now, the other car luckily got his license plate and different things, and they tracked him down. He was charged for leaving the scene and different things criminally had to turn it in to the disciplinary commission, got in trouble for his conduct, even though it was in his personal capacity for violating the rules of ethics, for leaving the scene of an accident and all these different areas that go to his fitness and character, you know, the things that they like to look at, the facility, the professionalism, and he was suspended for the practice of law. His conduct had nothing to do with practicing law. He was driving. But he got so mad and let those emotions and lost that civility, lost that professionalism and that demeanor that us as lawyers, we are held to a higher standard. So when we raised that, when we rose, excuse me, when we raised our right hand and we took that oath and we said we would abide by the rules, abide by the laws, uphold the Constitution, all of those things, it meant too that we would uphold civility and professionalism personally and professionally 24 hours a day seven days a week. And sometimes lawyers forget that fact. And we really have to stop and think about that. Judges have also really picked up on this civility initiative, wanting lawyers to be civil. And if you think of the most uncivil process in, say, a litigation or court proceeding, what would you think it would be? Now, kind of think about that in your head for a second, and maybe we'll have the same one. But the most uncivil process is normally discovery. How many of you love to be in the throes of heated discovery arguments of opposing counsel's hiding documents, claiming privilege when they shouldn't, blanking out or redacting everything to where you only have the words the on the page? Those different things cause those emotions, kind of like that road rage, that rage is coming up. And we have to stop on both sides, the person who's doing the conduct and the other person, And really ask ourselves, is this upholding the standards of truthful, honesty, openness, and getting to that justice and fairness? Yes, we have to zealously defend our client, but we have to balance that zealous defense against our duties of professionalism, civility, honesty, and fighting for the justice system of fairness and integrity in it. And judges are tired of discovery disputes. They are tired of lawyers acting unprofessionally, arguing over the little things, using name calling, hiding stuff, that incivility and not cooperating. They are tired of it. So in 2002, the Sedona Conference was launched as a think tank to confront some of these issues challenging the legal profession. One of them was the civility and cooperation among lawyers in disputes, particularly in discovery. And with this, they came about some initiatives. A lot of judges signed on to the Sedona Conference Proclamation, which says they were going to employ measures to try to have civility among lawyers in their courts. Sometimes these measures included, like in federal court, you have to have a face-to-face communication with opposing counsel before filing a motion to compel. The The judges want you to try to work it out with opposing counsel prior to stepping in their courtroom. This doesn't mean sending back and forth nasty emails because we all know a lot of people say mean things in email, but then won't say it to your face. 
This means having that simultaneous communication verbally with your opposing counsel before invoking the court to step into your squabble and to decide the facts for you. Now, obviously, some stuff still ends up in court just depending on the litigation, but sometimes that face-to-face -face communication can really help solve a lot of issues and end cooperation. Because again, people like to say stuff in email or on paper or in letter that they won't say to your face. And so taking that, you know, law or that lag time or that what people think is an invisible cloak out of the equation and making them confront face to face can really help with cooperation and civility. And so a lot of judges from the Sedona conference signed on to this. Other judges too, like there's someone I think it was in South Carolina, it was a family law judge. They made the attorney sign a civility proclamation if they were going to practice or litigate in front of that court. So what they said was, you know, they had the attorneys that were opposing counsel sign that they'd be civil, cooperate with each other, and try to work out the differences instead of always deploying the court resources to step in like a big brother and resolve it for them. So they signed a, phys phys excuse me, a civility proclamation if you were going to practice in front of that particular judge. A lot of judges started doing this. Some do not, some do. Some still take, you know, this Sedona Conference proclamation and really try to employ it through their court systems and jurisdiction. Think now the courts you litigate in. Are there some where you can kind of think back and say, oh, they did that. I didn't realize this is what it was for. And it could be that they're really trying to promote that professionalism, that civility, and that cooperation among attorneys. Illinois also has a commission on professionalism, which was under Supreme Court Rule 799C, known as Two Civility. They actually go into law schools and teach civility initiatives there in Illinois prior to law students becoming lawyers. They really try to promote and foster commitment to eliminate bias, discrimination, divisiveness in the systems, and really that equality across the board. So the Illinois Supreme Court has an initiative that they've had since 2005 to really promote the civility in their codes, their actions, and how they really bring up new lawyers. Because not every bar, not every Supreme Court goes in and talks to all of their law students at the law schools within the state to talk about civility or professionalism. Yes, law students take professional responsibility in school, but they're learning, you know, the ins and outs of the different rules, preparing for the MPRE when it comes up. They're not really talking about how do you conduct yourself? They're saying, here's the rules, follow them. But now there's that fine finesse, like what do you do as a professional? How do you conduct yourself as a professional? And that's really what, you know, lawyers and young lawyers really need taught. Because in civility, the question on the screen, can it breed professional discipline? The answer is yes, it can. And the rules, we kind of mentioned a few of them of where you're really going to get cited for incivility and unprofessionalism. We're going to talk about a little more in depth and then go through some examples of lawyers who've gone kind of foul with these rules, who really haven't abided by them who've had trouble upholding these rules and really probably should have been in trouble for a lot of their conduct. The first rule that you can get in trouble under is 8.4D. This is the big one. And I call this the catch all rule or the kitchen sink rule. This rule says that it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. Now, why do I call this the kitchen sink rule? We'll just read that again. Anything that is prejudicial to the administration of justice, can you define that? Think about it really hard. What does prejudicial to the administration of justice mean? It can mean something different to each of us. You may think your conduct's not prejudicial, but someone may else think it is prejudicial. You could just say, well, I'm being honest. The other person could say, well, you're being an ASS there could be different viewpoints. So what is prejudicial to the administration of justice? That's why I call this the kitchen sink rule, because almost any conduct that violates any other rule, or if your conduct is just egregious and they want to get you under a rule, this is the rule it's going to be. 
It can fit everything in the kitchen sink in it because of the phraseology. It is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. So this is one you will frequently see when we have uncivil lawyers, other professional lawyers, and just incivility in general and across the board. So it's one we really have to out for because again, it can reach any conduct that we have. Another rule that this is the one gaining more traction this was actually, this rule was actually adopted by the model rules in 2018. The other jurisdictions may have had it on their books before 2018, but the model rules itself did not fully adopt it until 2018. And even when the model rules fully adopted it in 2018, it was still met with a lot of controversy. The controversy that it was met with was that a lot of legal thought or analysts think that this rule infringes upon a lawyer's freedom of speech and a lawyer's freedom to believe what they want to believe. So let's read the rule here and see what you think. 8.4G says that a lawyer shall not engage in conduct that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know is harassment or discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, or socioeconomic status in conduct related to the practice of law. This is also the rule that I told you only applies to the practice of law, which you'll see there on that last line of the screen. This is not applied to your personal life, only your professional. Now, a lot of People against this rule being adopted in 2018 by the model rule said it infringes upon a lawyer's freedom of speech because we don't have the right to go out and speak what we believe if it's going to show bias or discrimination in any way. That's why they put that limiting language in there to try to take that criticism and address it. They said, okay, we understand we don't want to infringe on lawyers' personal freedom of speech, but while they're practicing law, they've agreed to conduct themselves as a lawyer should. So we're going to limit this to the practice of law and keep it on the books. So that limitation was put in there to kind of counteract the arguments that this infringed on a lawyer's freedom of speech. Some jurisdictions bought it. Some jurisdictions still forced against this and have not adopted 8.4G at all. They just keep and stay under 8.4D as in dog, that pre prejudicial to the administration of justice. But a lot of jurisdictions, especially in 2020, and with the protests and the riots and the things that have happened since 2020, have adopted this language to hold the lawyers to a higher standard and profession within the practice of law. Indiana, where I'm located, ha has this rule on the books and has had it even before the model rules adopted it. So it's been on the books here in Indiana for a long time. States such as like Texas, Connecticut really have not adopted it and really pushed against it and were advocates against it when the modern rules were wanting to adopt it in 2018. So you really need to go back to your specific jurisdiction and your local rules of professional conduct to see if you have this one on the books, to see if you have the anti-bias, anti-discrimination rule. Or do you just have prejudicial to the administration of justice, rule 8.4D? Either one, or if you have both, can get you for incivility and unprofessionalism. So you need to still have the proper conduct and do the proper things and watch out for the rules. Those consequences for incivility, obviously, we've already talked about the self-reporting 8.3, rule 8.3, if others know that you are being incivil or believe you are because they do have discretion whether to report. They just have a mandatory reporting standard if they know. Then they can report you under 8.3 because we're that self-regulating profession. Incivility and unprofessionalism also leads to violations not only of the two rules we talked about, 8.4D and 8.4G, but also it can get you in trouble with other rules such as 8.1.2, the client is the boss, if you're starting to be unprofessional and treating your client bad, you can violate Rule 1.2. If you're not being prompt in your communications, acting with diligence because, you know, you're being uncivil or just delaying things with your personality or you're fighting, you can violate Rule 1.3. 
if the incivility causes you not to communicate with your client or other persons or people involved, you can violate Rule 1.4. If it's causing you to lie to the tribunal, lie to third parties, or not be upfront honest or hide things, you can violate 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 4.1, 1, and so many others. So incivility and unprofessionalism not only violate, you know, the kitchen sink rule, 8.4D, prejudicial to administration justice, the anti-bias rule of discrimination, it can also lead into violations of all the other rules that we have in a cumulative effect. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip.